Hello everyone and welcome to our special session, Antimicrobial Surface Products 101, Practical Knowledge for Retail Food Service Professionals. I'm Chip Manuel from Gojo Industries and for about the next half hour, I'll be your presenter on this topic. Now we decided to come up with this topic because as you all know, 2020 has been a bit of a crazy year with the pandemic going on. Uh, and with the COVID-19 pandemics, we've seen a pretty big increase in the use of disinfectants and sanitizers. And we've gotten the, gotten the sense that there's been some confusion on these products as well. So the intent of this special session is to really ground the basic, ground retail food service professionals with some basic knowledge about these products. So here's an agenda for today's sessions. I'll start off a little bit with a brief introduction of myself and also Gojo Industries. We'll go into a little bit about the different regulations around surface products, because there's a lot of confusion in this area from what I what I can tell. And then we'll go into some best practices around chemical safety, chemical program implementation, and also specific aspects around pathogen control for things like norovirus. And we'll finish with some key takeaways and closing remarks. And I'll leave you with my contact info in case you need to get in touch with me. So just a brief introduction to myself and also Gojo, the company. So as I mentioned, I'm Chip Manuel. I've been around at Gojo for about a year and a half as a food safety science advisor. And in this role, I conduct food safety research and I serve as an internal and external subject matter expert on food science. Now, Gojo Industries has been around since the 1940s and it was actually born out of the wartime efforts. So the story goes, Goldie Lippman was working in a rubber factory in Akron. So if you know anything about Akron, you know that it's very famous for its rubber industry. And she was having to use carbon black, which is a, a compound that really stains your hands pretty bad. It's really tough to get off. And they were having to use uh, benzene, a really nasty chemical to, to clean the carbon black off the hands. Well, that didn't really suit well with her husband, Jerry Lippman. So he went down to the local university and tried to find a chemist that could find, that could create a product to remove this from her hands. And lo and behold, he ran into a pretty well-known surfactant chemist and they came up with the very first formulation for the Gojo waterless product that we still make today. So very humble beginnings, um, born out of a do it, get it done attitude, which still kind of exists in the company today. We're about 2,500 employees globally, uh, most well known for our Purell brand that we created in the 1980s. Uh, and we've started to expand that brand into new products, even outside hand sanitizer. So the Gojo purpose, we really do believe in saving lives and making lives better through well-being solutions. And this really came from our founders, Goldie and Jerry. And, and it really, we, we are very much a purpose-driven company. And we're also a, a company that is really into lifelong learning. So the very, the nice quote that we always hear in the company from Jerry is, everything I know I learned from someone else. So we're, we're a very curious company. We're willing to do research. And we're always recognize the importance of lifelong learning. Okay, so now that we're done with introductions, let's dive into a bit uh, about the regulatory aspect of some of these surface products. Now, we're probably all familiar with the CDC, the EPA, and the FDA, and you're probably wondering what are their different roles. And I've I've gotten questions or comments from people over the last year. Well, CDC CDC says to do this, and EPA says to do this, and FDA says you got to do this, and there's I get the sense there's a little bit of confusion out to what agent, what each agency does. So I just want to take a minute to break down each of these individual ones because they're 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 players in this space. So first we have the CDC, and the CDC acts as the U.S. federal public health agency. So they provide public health guidelines and recommendations that are based on science and their mission really is to protect the American people from any public health threat. So what's important here in terms of surface chemistries is that they may make recommendations related to surface sanitation, but they're not tasked with regulating the commerce of these. That's, that's what EPA is for. So often you'll see CDC advocate for things like 
bleach solutions for norovirus control, or maybe they'll say 70% ethanol for uh, COVID-19 control, but those are just recommendations. They're not binding requirements. And in fact, EPA has the regulatory space in, in this. So they, they really work together. Now the FDA is also an agency that you'll probably hear a lot about. And they're responsible for ensuring the safety and efficacy and security of uh, human and animal drugs, biological products, medical devices, and they also ensure the safety of our food supply, as well as some other things like cosmetics and products that emit radiation. So that'd be like microwaves. Um, so they really have a big regulatory task for enforcement. Um, of note in this space and food service, they regulate antimicrobial soaps and hand sanitizer as over-the-counter drug products. A lot of people don't really know that. So, you know, the production of of antimicrobial soaps and hand sanitizers, they have to go through the same rigor as, you know, other OTC drugs, you know, like Advil, Tylenol, um, those type of things. Now, this is really important to bring out because we've seen this a lot in since the COVID-19 pandemic, is it FDA approved? So you'll see some companies will advocate, well, they'll, they'll use this as a marketing approach, right? They'll have FDA approved on their label uh and is is this really true well it yes and no it depends on the product um and the best thing i can tell you is that in general in this space fda approved for things like antimicrobial soaps and hand sanitizers you're really not supposed to to do that um for for your marketing and so this site here is a really good site to go to um, and it kind of breaks down each sector in, that the FDA regulates, and it shows you what they pre-approve and what they don't pre-approve. So that's really the distinction here. So just want to point this out because there are a lot of products coming on the market that will say, hey, we're FDA approved, but that may or may not be true. One other thing about the FDA that we should mention is that they publish the food code. Now, the food code comes out every four years, and it's really intended to be a model food safety program for local, state, and, and uh, tribal and federal regulators. So those jurisdictions that are responsible for regulating their own food safety, uh, food safety rules, this is really a good model for them to build it from the ground up. So while it's not technically legally binding, it sort of serves as the gold standard for food safety inspection programs across the country. So where the food code plays with these surface products is they have very specific requirements around surface sanitizers, mostly around food contact surfaces. Uh, these are just a few examples that I've picked out. So for example, there are temperature requirements for chlorine, quat, and iodine-based solutions. And, and here's the section here if you want to look it up. There are pH and concentration requirements for chlorine solutions. Uh, specific requirements of when you need to use a sanitizer on food contact surface. And again, this is not an exhaust, exhaustive list, but just a few examples. So while the FDA doesn't regulate these product, these surface products directly, this food code, uh, the way it's written with some of the sections here, indirectly affects uh, these surface products and their use. So it's worth being familiar with these. Um, and how it relates to your establishment. All right, so the EPA is really the the agency that's responsible for enforcing these this sector. So uh, they enforce a variety of regulations, especially those around water and air quality and environmental management issues. And under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, uh, we call that FIFRA, EPA is responsible for regulation of pesticides. So this is one thing a lot of people don't really realize is that disinfectants and sanitizers, these, these are antimicrobial products. And by the word of the law, these bacteria and viruses and other things that these products kill, they're considered pest. And so these are considered pesticidal products. So that's why they fall under the EPA regulatory system. So what's really important here about these products is that um, to be legally sold in the U.S., these products have to go through an EPA pre-market approval. 
So that we call this the registration process. That's where EPA assesses, registers, regulates, and they're really regularly reevaluating all the pesticides legally sold in the U.S. So it's a it's a it's sort of a checks and balances process to make sure everyone is is selling something that's true and and safe, you know, true to the label. Um, selling something that's efficacious, it actually does what it says that it does. And it's given a, a layer of protection to uh, consumers and purchasers of these products so they know they're getting something that's legitimate. So as I mentioned, all EPA regulated products are required to undergo a pre-market approval process. Um, one thing I should note here is that this is only for chemical-based products. So devices that act as antimicrobial products, they don't really fall under EPA's purview. So they 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 don't get uh, regularly evaluated for efficacy and claims. And so there's we've seen a lot of these come on the market. And you know the best thing I can tell you is that ask for a lot of data. Show me the data if you're approached by some of these. Um, and just know that you're not going to have a stamp of approval by the EPA um, in terms of the efficacy claims. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So EPA scientists will review information submitted by a company. And what they do is they, um, the company will submit this in the form of a data packet. And this data packet is going to contain a variety of information. So first and foremost, the microbial efficacy data and claims. So to make specific claims on bacteria or viruses, there's always a uh, specific test that you have to pass. So this test data and protocol will be submitted to the EPA. Companies will also submit marketing material, you know, what language they're going to use on the label to market it and also the label use instructions. Now, this is really important, and we'll get into this a bit later, but these label use instructions have to be EPA approved. Chemistry data in the form of formulation and shelf life and stability testing are also submitted so that they're confident of the shelf life, the stability of the product. What you say is in there is really what's in there, and there's nothing that, that is in the formulation that could pose a threat to, to individuals. Also, there's toxicology data that you have to submit, and this sort of lets the, the EPA will assess this and determine what sort of safety profile the product will fit in. Now, the EPA process could take anywhere from six to 24 months, and it really depends on the complexity of the product and also the novelty of the product itself. So if you're submitting a new active ingredient, so an active ingredient is, is the re ingredient responsible for the actual antimicrobial properties, if you're submitting a new one, that can take a while, you know, on that longer end, one to two years. Um, and so it's, it really depends on the formulation and the product itself as to how long this registration process takes. So as I mentioned, the EPA has this registration process where they all products undergo pre-market approval. So once the product is approved, it's actually assigned this unique EPA registration number. So here is the um, an example of an EPA registration number here. Uh, legitimate products will have this number, so this is always important. Um, and the number is required by law to be visible on the package itself, on the product's label. This is a really useful link that you all should make sure you have in your bookmarks. So this is the publicly available database where all of the approved labels and approved products have are kept. And so if you go to this database, you can search by company name, product name, EPA registration number, and it'll pull up the master label uh, for you, which we'll talk about in a second. So as I mentioned, the EPA process, once the product's registered, uh, the EPA's master label will be on file in that database that I shared. And this is a really important thing to keep on hand. It's probably a good idea to keep a copy of the most recent master label on file for the chemicals you're using. Uh, the master label will have all EPA approved antimicrobial claims, the use instructions, and the marketing language. So 
any it's worth noting that any deviation from these use instructions uh, by FIFRA is considered a, a violation of federal law. So it's really important to make sure that you read and understand the label and that you follow it to a T. Here's an example from one of our products, uh, kind of what you'll see in a master label on this database. So this is a, just a shortened list of bacterial and viral kill claims. This is not exhaustive, but I just wanted to bring out what sort of what you expect to see when you dig into these EPA master labels. So real quick, we've seen a little bit of confusion on the words cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and the popular media will use these terms interchangeably, although that's not technically correct. Um, first is cleaning. So cleaning is really important because what you're trying to do here is to remove dirt, soil, organic materials from the surface. It's really important to do this because some of the dirts and soils will actually have negative interaction with the sanitizer and or disinfectant, so it can reduce the efficacy of these products. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that for many, many sectors, like for example, in the food code for food contact surfaces, you're actually required to clean before sanitizing and disinfecting, uh, specifically to remove that dirt, soil, food debris, and so forth. So that's cleaning. You're really, you're looking to remove dirt and soils, not necessarily inactivate or kill any, any pathogens. So sanitizing is intended to reduce bacteria and surfaces to a safe level, and it's not really intended to kill all bacteria. So these are these are antimicrobial products that are a little more mild than disinfectants, and that's sort of the distinction between the two. As we see here, disinfectants will have a higher level of efficacy than sanitizers, and these are the products that will have claims not just for bacteria, but for fungi, viruses, uh, and maybe spores. Not necessarily. It depends on the class of disinfectant. But it, the good way of thinking about this is that they're a little more higher power than sanitizers. Now, recently, there have been some sanitizers that have come on the market that uh, they pass all of the sanitizers tests and they also pass all of the disinfecting tests. So they're, they're kind of a dual product. Um, not many of them exist, but we, we do have an example that I'll go through at the end. But I just wanted to bring that out. There's, traditionally, they're thought of as two different, completely different products. And for the vast majority of the time, that is true. But some newer ones have come on um, the market that that you know kind of break this mold all right so that's a little bit about the regulatory landscape of these products now let's go into some general best practices that really any food safety manager or food retail food service professional should know so first and foremost read and understand the label and as I mentioned, going to that database that I'll link here below is really important to download a copy of that master label, review it, and understand it. So some of the important information you need to understand is the required contact times for product efficacy. So not every product works as fast as each other. Uh, use instructions, so how, how to use the product properly. Remember, these use instructions are they're reviewed by EPA, so they're, they're considered true and this is what you should adhere to to maximize the product's efficacy. Any safety considerations, including precautions, PPE requirements, or disposal considerations. So not all products have the same safety profile. You may have, have a product that requires gloves and other PPE and may not know it. And this is why it's important to use, look at these labels to understand. And also it'll have manufacturer contact information so that you can get in touch with anyone when you might have an issue. And as I mentioned to FIFRA states that if you don't use the product according to the use instructions, that could constitute a violation of law. And more importantly, it puts your guests and employees at risk. If, if you're using a product incorrectly, you're not getting the efficacy out of it. You're really not doing a good job at protecting those guests and employees. So some other general best practices, this is really, really important. Under no circumstances should anyone be mixing chemicals together. Um, this can be really, really dangerous. And unfortunately, some deaths recently have been reported due to some chemical mixing. This can create toxic fumes or even explosive conditions. 
Uh, one particular watch out is some of your heavy oxidizers like bleach concentrate. Never, ever, ever mix those with acidic products or high pH products. Um, that's where you're going to create some of that toxic fumes that can be quite dangerous. So if possible, choose products that you know have a better safety profile and don't have the concern um, that, that some may have. So training of staff is also incredibly important. And, you know, a good product that works quickly, that kills a lot, it's only one piece of the puzzle, right? If you have staff that are using it incorrectly or not using it at all, then it doesn't it doesn't do any good. So, you know, without proper training, if you have incorrect use of the product, you're actually probably putting yourself at more risk or your establishment at more risk. And the other piece of the puzzle here is that you don't just train just to train, train and then follow up. So you need to constantly assess your employees to see, are they using the product right? Are they doing what they should be doing? Are they using it when they should? You know, because if you see that they, they aren't, then that means you need more training. Uh, so it really is an iterative process. Train the staff, monitor the staff, and assess if you need more training. So along with training is ad adopting a program that is really easy to execute. So the easier the program is to execute, the more likely you'll have compliance of that program and the more risk you're going to control for your establishment. So when possible, always choose products that have really fast kill times, right? Uh, and this is sort of a thought experiment here. If you think about the relationship between compliance to the label instructions, so that is, did you wait the required contact time versus the contact time as it gets longer here, this is 10 minutes. Conceptually, you can kind of intuitively, you know that people aren't going to wait 10 minutes when it gets out here, right? It's just harder to train people to wait those, those required contact times. So to really get the benefit of uh, easier to execute, better compliance. This is why you need to choose products that have uh, the faster kill times. Now, another item or, or product type that's come on the market that can help with ease of execution are wipes. So they're uh, a format. They've been around for a little while. They're starting to gain a lot of popularity in food settings, mostly due to ease of use. And so, you know, if this is something that you're interested in, I would encourage you to check them out. They're a little bit of a premium product, but because of their ease of use, there may be a return for your establishment. So we just talked about some general best practices for use of these surface products. Let's go into something a little more specific detail, and that's best practices around norovirus control. So as we all know, this is a pathogen that's the number one cause of foodborne illness in the country. And restaurants remain the main outbreak setting for foodborne cases of this virus. Now, focus may have been diverted away from controlling norovirus during the COVID-19 pandemic, and justifiably so. This is a pretty serious situation. But establishments should always stay vigilant on norovirus control. It hasn't gone away. And in fact, we're entering the colder, starting the end of the, the colder months of the year, and that's when traditionally norovirus spikes. And, you know, what really resonates with people is how infectious norovirus is. And this infographic here on the right kind of illustrates this quite well. You know, if you look at all the norovirus that would be located on the head of a pin, that's enough to infect more than 1,000 people. So it's a really infectious virus, and it's it's going to stick, stick with us for years after the COVID-19 pandemic's over. So I just want to go into little bit of a refresher on some of your best practices for controlling this virus. So as I mentioned, restaurants are one of the main, or they are the main source of foodborne norovirus outbreaks. And in a study a few years back, when these outbreaks investigations really, when, when researchers did a deep dive into the investigation, what they found is that over 80% of the foodborne norovirus outbreaks, there was a food worker that was sort of the key pivotal 
aspect of the of the outbreak. So they were the ones responsible for it. So this is could be a, that person had a sanitation failure. That person had a hygiene failure. That person came in sick. Uh, but what's this is really highlights the importance of of making sure that your employees know their best practices for norovirus control, which we'll go into. So first and foremost, uh, I think this goes without saying that keep sick employees out of work, uh, and it really parallels the COVID-19 situation. If you have employees coming to work that are sick with norovirus or any virus and they're shedding it, you know, they're putting others at risk and they're putting an outbreak at risk. So the business is at risk as well. And there's been some studies like this one shown here that keeping employees out of work when they're sick with norovirus is the, is the number one way to prevent norovirus outbreaks from happening in these settings. So one way to do this is to implement a health screening policy and make sure that any symptoms are, are caught. So nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, those are your classic norovirus symptoms. And any employee that has these symptoms are not allowed to work. And they should remain at home for 24 to 48 hours after symptoms resolve. You should always check with your jurisdiction or your, your local health ordinance to see what, what their recommendations are. So proper hand washing is, we all know it's a cornerstone of food safety best practices and and really, this is a great way to control norovirus as well, as also mentioned in this paper. So ensure your staff are complying with guidelines for hand washing, uh, including the technique and the length of time of the hand wash. You know, CDC has a lot of uh, infographics available to help with this. This is just one example, um, but making sure you're constantly training your employees to wash their hands properly, wash your hands often is extremely important. So another area that is really important for norovirus control in these establishments is frequent disinfection of touch surfaces. So key touch points like doorknobs, faucets, tables, chairs, and so forth. You know, this virus, if it gets on that surface, can spread to other people uh, through, this, through when they touch these surfaces. We call that fomite transmission. And it's been documented many times for norovirus. So it's really important to have an SOP for disinfecting these surfaces on a frequent basis. And sometimes I get asked about how often should I be doing this? Well, the reality is it's as frequently as realistically possible, right? So you wanna make sure your frequency of touch point disinfection is, um, is something that you can execute on. If you do it too frequently and the system breaks down, well, then you're really not helping anyone. So you just have to take a step back and think about what is realistic for my staff to execute. All right, so those are some best practices for norovirus control. And we do have um, a couple products I wanna just highlight that, that are great for norovirus control and also other pathogens. So the first is our food service surface sanitizer, which was launched a few years ago. So this is an alcohol-based formula that's food contact safe, so it does not require any rinse on food contact surfaces, but it has a very powerful kill, um, set of kill claims and kill times. So norovirus, E. coli, salmonella, 30 seconds, hepatitis A, and human coronavirus in 60 seconds. Um, so it does have the power of a disinfectant, but at the same time, the safety profile of a food contact surface sanitizer. So it's fragrance free, no hand washing required after use, no harmful chemicals or smells. Uh, works really well as a cleaner across a bunch of different surfaces, both hard and soft surfaces. Um, really you don't see a lot of side effects like pitting and etching that you may see with some heavy oxidizers. The, the only watch out with this product is not to use it on any sort of soft metal because it does have a high pH and that can accelerate the oxidation of things like brass and copper, which is not really unusual. Uh, it's an easy to use, so it's ready to use product, no mixing required, so you don't have to have staff doing any sort of dilutions on site. And the last product I want to share with you today is our new Purell Food Service Surface Sanitizing Wipes. So these are just being launched, and they really take a, um, what we're known for from a combination of product safety and powerful efficacy and combine it to an easy to use wipe. So like our surface spray, this is a food contact safe 
formula. You don't have to rinse after use. You don't have to wash your hands after use. No PP required. But at the same time, it does have disinfectant claims. It's powerful enough with its alcohol-based formula to meet those disinfectant requirements. So norovirus, salmonella, E. coli, listeria, cold and flu, human coronavirus, these are just some of the claims that this product has. And it's easy to use. That's the that's the really good thing about wipes is that it's they're ready to go. You just pull it and use it. And it really helps create a program that's easy to execute and increases and enhances compliance. All right, so we've reached the end of our special session today. I just want to leave you with some key takeaways and high level thoughts from the last half hour. So obviously COVID-19 has been an incredibly stressful situation and this pandemic has led to a, a pretty remarkable increase in the use of surface sanitizers and disinfectants. And we've seen there's some confusion around these products and the use of the products. So gaining a better understanding of these products will really help to reduce risk of any sort of illness outbreak happening in your establishment. So some key takeaways in terms of best practices, general product best practices, always read and fully understand the product's label and paying special attention to the use instructions, contact times, and safety precautions. I think if you really get all three of these uh, down and you understand them well, you're gonna, that alone is gonna help reduce the risk in your establishment. If possible, choose products that have really fast kill times with the pathogens you're concerned with. Uh, the faster the product works, the easier it is to execute, and then your compliance by staff goes up. And remember, it's not just the product that makes a good program, it's the product and how well your staff's executing on your SOP and complying to the SOP. And finally, norovirus is sort of lurking in the background, um, but remember, this is the number one cause of foodborne illness, and we are entering the colder months, so understand that it, it will come back. So how you control this virus is emphasis of hand washing, frequent touch point disinfection on other things, doorknobs and, and faucets, and keeping sick employees home is, is, is the best way. So if anyone has norovirus symptoms, they need to stay home, um, and that helps with control of this virus. So I want to thank you for your attention for the last half hour. Uh, this is my contact information in case and touch me with any questions regarding the, the content of today's presentation or our products. And I just want to wish you a nice day and thanks for your attention.